for inviting me. It's really great uh, to well, be with you and uh, to learn quite a lot from you. Uh, and it's also great to, to be here with Care, who was my supervisor in 1992, 1993, and 1994. And uh, it's always a great pleasure to, well, to be with him. So thank you. Um, so today uh, I would like to talk about the. We don't have this thing. Oh, we might have put it. Might be there. Sorry, no, it's okay. No, no, it's no, okay. It's okay. No, no. All right. So today I will talk about homosexuality in the Eastern Bloc, but this is a slightly misleading title because basically I will talk about Hungary. <laughs> different uh, disciplines and actually I had a constant identity crisis, professional identity crisis I guess. By now I call myself a sociologist but when I do archive research I always tell the archivists that I, I know something about history as well then they start to view me as a normal human being. <laughs> so anyway, I'm doing now for a few years, I mean I started this uh, years ago but I got this uh, uh, support from the Hungarian Scientific Research Fund just two years ago to do this uh, well, social history of homosexuality in 20th century Hungary before 1990 project and uh, uh, part of, as part of this project I'm, um, I'm doing some uh, well, historical work as well and um, we can say that uh, uh, well, I, I, I thought that it's very important to focus on this part of our history because we have uh, well, a lot of untold stories which we should well, still dig out. And also, as a part of this uh, project, I'm, uh, I'm doing archive uh, uh, research, of course, but I'm also interviewing uh, elderly uh, gays and lesbians. And uh, that's very important because these people, like, I mean, we have completed 16 that's interviews like last year. And there are already like four or five people who died, you know, in the last uh, uh, few years. So this is why I'm, I'm, I'm always encouraging people that please, you know, go out for the, you know, for those, uh, you know, elderly uh, uh, comrades and, uh, and well, try to kind of collect their voice and their memories because, you know, they won't be with us. So, um, we can say that until recently, historians and uh, social scientists have paid uh, pretty little attention to gays and uh, lesbians uh, and their movements in the Eastern Bloc. And this uh, is particularly the case in terms of state socialism and uh, the period between 1945 and 1990. There are some notable exceptions, and some of them I have uh, uh, collected here. Uh, well, I guess some, some of you might be familiar with Dan Levy's uh, work, which is, I guess, I mean, I, I like it very much. Uh, this Greenwood Encyclopedia of LGBT issues worldwide, it has in the second volume uh, some of the European countries included. I have to say that this is not necessarily the, uh, well, an outstanding uh, level of academic work, but it's uh, still something. Uh, on the other hand, I, uh, I'm very pleased uh, with this uh, Queer Cities, Queer Cultures book, uh, which was edited and uh, misquoted the, the title by Jennifer Evans and Matt Cook, uh, because well, it has some uh, well, European cities, including uh, uh, European queer cities, including, uh, for example, not just Amsterdam, which was written by Kert, uh, the Amsterdam chapter, or Paris or London, but also Ljubljana, for example, and Budapest. Uh, um, and um, well, finally, uh, uh, I want to call your attention to Francesca Stella's uh, new book uh, on lesbian lives in Soviet and also with Russia, which just came out like a few weeks ago. So this is it. So in addition, there have been some publications in native languages within the respective East Central European countries, uh, as well, of course, which I won't list here. 
Um, and in the past few years, however, scholarship is rapidly expanding on LGBTQ issues and more generally non-normative gender and sexuality within the countries of the former Eastern Bloc. Thanks to new controversies around growing official homophobia, discrimination, and violence against LGBTQ communities in various Eastern European countries, the focus tends to remain on the post-1898 uh, era. Um, uh, despite the growing interest in contemporary LGBTQ politics in the region, as well as uh, the ongoing historicizing of life under socialism, sexual politics or gay politics and socialism, state socialism, are rarely examined together. The important exception is the case of East Germany and the, especially the work of Josie uh, McLellan. In addition, there is also uh, exciting work on uh, state socialist Czechoslovakia from Vera Sokolova, perhaps you know, the Rainbow Alive, uh, the Rainbow Alive under the Red Star, state, state approaches to sexuality and non-heterosexual lives in communist Czechoslovakia. <coughs> in contrast, there has been a burgeoning literature on gay social movement in the West. Uh, these work underscore how gay and lesbian movements in Western Europe and North America gained newfound momentum during the late 1960s and the early 1970s. It was in the context of anti-establishment and utopian ideas of the new left, along with the anti-war civil rights and student movements, that gay liberation uh, movements uh, became increasingly visible across the Western world. Thus the demands uh, for that criminalization of homosexuality and ending the legal and social marginalization of lesbian and gay communities were embedded in the demands of counterculture movements. Concomitant uh, to social and politi political movements of the 1960s, the growing visibility of homosexual subcultures in the West were intimately tied to capitalism and the rapidly expanding consumer culture. Life during state, uh, uh, late state socialism, of course, varied quite uh, 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 widely across the Eastern Bloc. In Hungary, following the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, the communist leadership decided to appease society by allowing limited economic privatization and greater freedom than most of the, their counterparts in the Eastern Bloc. The Hungarian Revolution in 1956 was initially an attempt um, um, uh, to introduce reforms within state socialism, but it turned into a revolution for Hungary's independence and it was soon crushed by the Soviet forces. The immediately following years saw retaliation and terror. However, from the 1960s, a new regime was gradually introduced, but came to be known as Frigider Socialismus, Refrigerator Socialism, before referring to the rapidly growing access to consumer goods, such as refrigerators and television sets, that used to be considered luxury items. Uh, the strict totalitarian state control was also replaced by a milder form of authoritarian control that left some, at least, um, a not directly controlled space for private life. In addition, the state also invested in social goods, which along with the mainly state-sponsored grey market and access to cons consumer products made Hungary earn the nickname the happiest barrack in the Eastern Bloc. <laughs> People could increasingly carve out personal space and spend time in informal groups outside of the strict state, state control. Young people especially were active in trying to create their own private space. Yet, in Hungary, similarly to the rest of Eastern, uh, the Eastern Bloc, uh, Bloc, effects of social movements and political radicalism of, the, of Western movements of the 1960s barely made an impact. Prior to uh, 1961, uh, homosexuality, sorry, um, but, uh, yeah, this is the frigider socialism, yes. Um, so prior to 1961, homosexuality was not only a taboo, but according to the Hungarian penal code, also criminal activity. In terms of regulating same-sex sexuality, Hungary criminalized sex between men in 1878, 
closely following paragraph 175 of the German Penal Code. Uh, besides countries that didn't criminalize homosexualities, in most countries it was only sodomy between males that was criminalized. Exceptions, there are exceptions, these include, for example, Austria and Finland, where both female and male homosexual acts were criminalized. Um, accordingly, paragraph 241 of the Hungarian Penal Code criminalized sexual acts between a man, unnatural, that is non-reproductive uh, sexual acts between men and women, and bestiality, as termis at elleni fajtalanság, perversion against nature or unnatural fornication, and they were punishable by up to one year of in imprisonment. Uh, and paragraph 242 made non-consensual acts of unnatural fornication punishable by up to five years in prison, with the potential of life imprisonment if the act caused the death of the plaintiff. The conceptualization of homosexuality followed a general pan-European pattern. Prior to criminalization of sex between men, homosexuality had been defined as a sin. From the late 19th century, homosexuality was increasingly seen as an illness, while at the same time it was also considered as a form of social deviance. Following the establishment of state socialism, homosexuals continued to be seen as unreliable elements and the police monitored homosexuals and their known meeting places. Like elsewhere in the Eastern Bloc in Hungary, homosexuality was deemed a perversion, pathology or deviance. Although the exact numbers are difficult to pin down, it's clear that homosexuals were persecuted in unprecedented, uh, unprecedented numbers throughout the 1950s. For example, in the records of the Budapest criminal courts, there are already, approximate, oh, there are already approximately 800 cases involving charges of unnatural fornication between 1949 and 1962. During the Rakushi era, between 1948 and 1956, named after Matyas Rakushi, the general secretary of the Hungarian Communist Party, who liked to refer to himself as Stalin's best pupil, homosexuality was not simply a crime against morality, but a crime against socialism. In line with terror and repression that the Rakoshi system imposed on anyone who dissented from the official Stalinist line, homosexuals were deemed enemies of the socialist nation. The, consoli the consolidation during the 1960s, which eased the grip of, com of the communist state over society, brought the first changes in the relationship between homosexuality and the penal code since 1878. Additionally, the circle of potential perpetrators <coughs> and victims also changed in 1961. Gender equality was introduced regarding unnatural fornication for which men and women uh, could <laughs> equally be prosecuted from uh, 1961. But unnatural fornication conducted with animals was not penalized any longer from 1961. The following is the official reasoning um, for the decriminalization of consensual sex between men. So you can read it that homosexual is either an inborn sexual perversity rooted in a developmental disorder or such acquired anomaly that develops mainly within neurotic people as a result of some sort of sexual impression during childhood. And well, you can read it. And um, um, so actually, it was, it was quite a biological uh, reasoning that why you should leave them alone or at least not, uh, don't imprison them. According to the awkwardly phrased text, homosexuality was a perversion which could be an inborn or required disposition, regardless of its origin. However, once homosexuality manifest, manifested itself, it could not be cured. And hence, the reasoning went that its, its, this, its criminalization was unwarranted. On practical grounds, the decriminalization of homosexuality was justified for eliminating the possibility of the blackmailing business which had surrounded urban homosexuality. Blackmailing had been used to argue for the decriminalization of homosexual practices since the late 19th century in countries where homosexual acts were criminalized. The pioneer legal advocacy group to use this argument 
was Magnus Hirschfeld's scientific humanitarian community in Germany in the early 20th century. And it was also used in early 20th century in Hungary as well by lawyers. In 1961, the legalization of homosexual relations was granted in such a manner that held the legalized same-sex sexual relationship to a different set, set of standards than of uh, heterosexual relationships, as well as allowed ways for the authorities to continue to press charges against homosexuals. The age of consent for same-sex relationships, irrespective of one sex, was set to 20 years old, considerably higher than 14 years, which was the, the, the age of consent for heterosexual relationships. Furthermore, there was a special clause introduced on perversion against nature conducted in a scandalous manner, for which one could be sentenced with up to three years of imprisonment. In 1978, the age of consent for homosexual relationships was reduced to 18 years old, it was not until 2002, actually, that the age of consent was set at 14 years old for all consensual heterosexual relations. The different ages of consent and potentially causing public scandal provided good opportunities for state authorities, such as the police, to keep alleged homosexuals, homosexual practices under close control. Um, however, according to the available records of the Budapest City Archive, after 1962, there is a significant drop in criminal charges against homosexual men. Between 1962 and 1989, at the Budapest Criminal Courts, there are approxim approximately 56 cases uh, with charges of uh, these two uh, paragraphs. Um, consequently, by the Kadar era, named after Janos Kadar, uh, the uh, general um, uh, secretary of the Hungarian Communist Party between 1956 and 1988 seemed to have brought to hold the aggressive prosecution of homosexuals, the long tradition of specialized state surveillance of homosexuality could continue after 1961 too. There's evidence uh, that decriminalization um, and legal changes didn't prevent authorities from the enduring compilation of homosexual inventories, which have been part of regular police work, especially in urban areas since the early 20th century. The registering of men, on the one hand, provided information on potential <coughs> sexual victims, and on the other hand, could also serve as a method of coercion to turn homosexual men into police informants. Given the entrenched society-wide homophobia, internalized shame, and the fear of being outed, the police could use people's homosexuality to pressure into informing on their acquaintances and even loved ones. Public perception and attitude towards homosexuality closely followed the official view. Sexually desiring one's own gender was considered sick and as a medical aberration by a great majority of the Hungarian people. The perception of homosexuality, moreover, seemed to be gendered, whereas female homosexuals or lesbians were still considered to be women. In terms of male homosexuals, this was not the case. Accordingly, in the eyes of contemporaries, the male homosexual, the, the male homosexual was a boozy, a faggot, or poof, and not a real man. Such perception underscores the strict boundaries and insecurities of the exclusively heteronormative scripts of Hungarian masculinity. But even if the regime, as well as the public, seem to show somewhat more tolerance towards lesbians, overall both male and female homosexuality was seen as, the, uh, as despicable. At the same time, not unlike, not unlike in Western Europe and elsewhere, Hungarian homosexual men and women had to struggle with social and economic structure barriers, which were for the most part unknown to the heterosexual counterparts, having to navigate their life within the paternalistic state socialist system predicated on socialist heterosexual monogamy that shaped both public and private life. Perhaps one of the most unique aspects of state socialism in perhaps one of the most unique aspects of state socialism in terms of shape, shaping sexual morals and personal relationships was access to private space. In theory, according to the socialist law, every individual over 18 had the right to his or her, her uh, space or own flat. 
In practice, however, only those who were married had the realistic chance to secure an apartment. Given the circumstances, marriage became, or rather continued, to serve as not only an economic and social safety net, but also as a means of, secure, of securing basic privacy. By the early 1980s, however, the so-called lockage care dish, the apartment issue or question, the lack of access to private space, even if one was married, became a nationwide social issue. Changing demographic patterns with people living longer and the coming age of the children born during the Rotko era in the <coughs> 1950s, when abortion was uh, forbidden and for a short period of time even childlessness tax was introduced in Hungary. So um, um, this all posed an infrastructure problem uh, for the paternalistic state that was supposed to take care of its citizens. Um, in addition, having seen the misery of the parents and being aware of the rapidly rising divorce rates, the young, young people were increasingly less willing to single, ma single marriage or having their own space. But all this meant for homosexuals were twofold. On the one hand, considering that securing an apartment became difficult even for those who were married, most homosexuals faced a steep road if they hoped to obtain a fact. Unless they were married and living in a heterosexual relationship, being single and without children put them on the bottom of the waiting list. Although it's difficult to estimate, but there were a lot of homosexual men who decided to get married to a woman because of, of social pressure and internalized homophobia, or alternatively, there were some who recognized their homosexuality while already married. For example, in, in, in 1988, Lajos Romsewer, a leading gay activist and the divorced father of a 17-year-old girl, stated that two-thirds of Hungary's homosexuals are married, which causes a lot of problems and neuroses. And he was not only a gay activist, but he was a psychiatrist, so this, this was his kind of professional view. <laughs> on, the other hand, on the other hand, being free of social and economic constraints of marriage, gay men and lesbian women had more time to fulfill their desire, seek out other gays and lesbians in the hopes of finding a partner. At the most basic level, homosexuals had to make themselves instantly recognizable to each other, while at the same time they needed to remain invisible to heterosexuals around them. Having to find information and locating each other and meeting places were initially challenging, but according to both contemporary and also recent interviewees, once homosexuals found their clandestine subculture, they found an emotionally as well as materially supportive community. Stigmatized by society as a medical defect and being a general taboo in the state-controlled media, nevertheless, from the late 1970s, homosexuality seemed to gain increasing visibility and provided growing concerns uh, for the authorities. Um, the one and only study about sexuality that was conducted during the state socialist era underscores how the 1970s the homosexual lifestyle was considered as one of the typical and widespread forms of sexual relationships in Hungary. Sociologists at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, actually it was my institute at that, that time, I, well, I was like 10 years old, um, <laughs> ran a study from between 1969 and 1971, no, I was just two years old, <laughs> featured the homosexual character as one of the eight most common sexual scripts within Hungarian society. The research focused on the sexuality-related value orientation and attitudes of 250 young Hungarian workers and university students aged between 18 and 24. Um, yeah, sorry. It's, uh, um, uh, okay. Uh, in the first phase, respondents had to form a hierarchy of, um, of uh, 11 categories. Um, and, uh, so actually, they had to kind of rank what is more important, happy marriage or having children or belief in something or eating, drinking or orderly sexual life, which I don't know, it wasn't, you know, 
it was it was said what it should mean orderly sexual life. <laughs> but a specific section of the survey presented eight sexual stories about sexual practices which were identified by the researchers as typical and widespread in Hungarian society. There were four female characters: the, vir the virgin who wants to have sex only after being married. Then the demi-vir, the half virgin, who would practice petting but avoid penetrative sex, following the principle that everything is allowed if it goes without trace. Then the unwed the single mother who was used by her male partner for sex, but being left by him after falling pregnant, now devoting herself to bringing up her baby in decency. And the fourth uh, female character, the prostitute, who meets her casual partners in night bars and sleeps with them for financial reward. The three typical male figures included the unmarried womanizer, whose only goal is to have as many female sexual partners as he can. The homosexual, who has always been attracted to men but never been involved in any scandals. And the regularly masturbating male, a healthy young man who, for various controlled reasons, is unable to satisfy his sexual desires in any other ways. The eighth story was about an unmarried couple who fell in love and after a while they felt that it was completely natural that they would have sex. Respondents had to evaluate the five-point scale, not only how much they liked or disliked the main characters of these stories, but also they had to indicate whether in their view these characters are appealing or unappealing uh, for society as large. Um, according to the research findings, the most liked characters included the free love cultivating couple and the single mother, the latter one being the absolute favorite of young female workers, while the other three groups of respondents favored the couple somewhat more. While all groups of respondents indicated that these forms of behavior are much more or less appealing to society at large than to them. In the respondents' views, um, the least appealing characters included the prostitute, the homosexual, the half virgin, the womanizer, and the regular masturbator. However, they also indicated that in their view, social attitudes towards prostitution, and especially homosexuality, were much more negative than their opinion. So they, they were the liberals, of course. The virgin character, the virgin character was viewed in an ambivalent way. Uh, uh, no, um, I don't go into this anyway. By all groups of respondents, except the young male workers, the most rejected character was the prostitutes. Her practices were negatively evaluated because of two, re two main reasons. The prostitutes' behavior cannot be grounded on material need in our socialist society. You don't need extra money. Uh, <laughs> and the dangers of emotionless sex leading to the development of personality impoverishment. Additionally, young female workers refer to the dangers of sexually transmitted diseases, very practical. However, there were also a few intolerant views expressed, pointing to the fact that sex works cannot be maintained without clients. The reception of the demi virch was only slightly better than that of the prostitute by university students, while young workers, especially young female workers, showed more understanding towards this form of behavior, you know, the patting without trace. Um, uh, quite a few respondents blame hypocrisy for such behavior by recognizing how difficult it might be to satisfy a sex demanding partner to avoid pregnancy and to keep one's marriageability intact all at the same time. The homosexual character was the most rejected uh, character by young male workers and the second most rejected after the prostitute by young female workers while university students observe the prostitute and the half virgin uh, characters with more dislike than the homosexuals. So the you know, university students were you know, more critical to the prostitutes and this half virgin, whatever. The homosexual character was viewed mostly as a mix mixture of rejection and pity, they said in uh, some of the quotes. This is an illness that cannot be squarely condemned, and another. It's up to him whether he seeks treatment. But some respondents also express a certain level of understanding by pointing out that he has the right to do it if he doesn't violate others and does it and does whatever he does with similar ones. 
These sexual stories and their, and their perception can be seen as designating the potential scope of sexual scripts that were available in state socialist Hungary, both at the sociocultural and at the interpersonal level of contradiction between the perceptions of personal and social attitudes towards different forms of deviations from the institutionally prescribed forms of sexual normativity, and also signaling how different behavioral and value preferences may intersect with gender and class positions, even in an allegedly classless and gender neutral state socialist context. <coughs> One of the most unexpected components of the survey following a brave decision of the researchers was the inclusion of the hom of homosexuality into the repertoire of typical and widespread, widespread sexual practices. The complete sexual story of the homosexual character was the following. Conrad, that's the name of the, of the character, Conrad is not interested in women. He has always been attracted to men. He seeks the acquaintance of men who are similar to him, with whom they can satisfy each other's sexual needs. He is discreet in his relationships. He has never gotten himself into a scandal because of his homosexuality. He thinks it's completely his and his partner's business that they deal with their sexual life in this way. So this was the story. This narrative presents Conrad in a rather neutral, though slightly distancing way, the only potentially negative element being the reference <coughs> to the possibility of some sort of homosexuality-related scandal, which he has successfully been able to avoid. However, it should be observed that such an approach limits homosexual practices to the publicly unnoticeable sphere of privacy of only men in this case and thus implying that in the given social context only the manifestations of privately kept homosexuality might be perceived as typical and widespread. Um, from, the, from the late 1970s, uh, police reports, and we go back, uh, uh, police reports began to call attention what they saw was a visible rise of homosexual activities in the Hungarian capital. As one of the police reports uh, uh, stated, um, according to the registries, operative data, and, ad and additional information, there are about 50,000 known Hungarian homosexuals with 45,000 uh, living in Budapest. The evident rise of homosexual prostitution is a new phenomenon, they registered, which in terms of its scale is comparable to heterosexual um, prostitution. There seem to be an increasing number of known homosexuals, a growing demand for same-sex sex, and most troubling from the police perspective, a rising sexual assault rate among men. This, the fact that the police was concerned with sexual assault rates within the homosexual community is ironic, really, uh, considering the lack of official attention to violence within <coughs> heterosexual relations. For instance, the same penal code that decriminalized hom uh, homosexuality in 1961 allowed immunity to perpetrators of violence who were tended to be exclusively men in heterosexual relationships as long as the violence occurred within marriage or in relationships that would end in marriage. Uh, um, uh, so this, therefore, it's you know there was very little official concern there, but they were still worried about you know homosexual relationships. The causes uh, the authorities argued had to do with the emergence of a new generation of homosexuals who, unlike their uh, predecessors, no longer accepted a completely closeted, closeted lifestyle. The following uh, is it. Uh, Yes, uh, the following, this is it. The, the, the following is an expert, uh, excerpt uh, from a police report of 1988, marveling at uh, these unprecedented phenomena that could potentially contribute to the efforts of establishing a homosexual advocacy organization in the future. And I think this is quite um, uh, informative if you read it. Um, the police report also reflects that despite police surveillance, black mirrors, and being stigmatized by society, homosexual men, and to a much lesser degree lesbians, cultivated a growing subculture. Although homosexuality had been decriminalized and visibility of homosexuals was on the rise, there could be no gay organizations and there was no official 
recognized homosexual movement in Hungary. Such, of course, was a characteristic of the whole Eastern Bloc, where communist parties, in accordance with the state socialist rule, prohibited the formation of any kind of NGOs, including homosexual organizations. East Germany um, seemed to be the only exception to this, where following the decriminalization of male same-sex activity in 1968, the state provided increasing space for gay activism. In the context of Hungary, it was the appearance of HIV AIDS um, um, that proved to be the catalyst for change. As early as 1985, an official report was presented uh, to the Central Committee of the Hungarian Socialist Workers' Party on AIDS-related international situation and the proposed Hungarian measures. Being alarmed by the possibility of the spread of the gay disease in Hungary, state socialist authorities came to see the establishment of homosexual organization <laughs> as a necessity to prevent a national health crisis. In um, January uh, 1988, the Hungarian Ministry of Health issued a theoretical permission for establishing a homosexual organization. And the ministry official stated on Hungarian television that such an organization would be justified, among other things, by the fact that homosexual practices may be hotbeds of disease. Um, from the party leader's perspective, allowing an establishment of the, uh, an, an official homosexual organization seemed to be a quite pragmatic solution to two pressing problems, spreading HIV AIDS and, the rise, and rising homosexuality. By allocating the responsibility of sexual education to an explicitly gay organization, authorities were hoping to reach the wider spectrum of homosexuals and therefore prevent the outbreak of an AIDS epidemic. At the same time, by having one formal organization in charge of dealing with and, and, uh, with and representing the homosexual and lesbian community, the authorities could also have an easier time to practice surveillance over the gay community. From the perspective of the leaders of the gay and lesbian community, the fear of AIDS uh, by the valid concert was more than anything uh, seen as an opportunity to finally create a gay organization, not unlike the ones already existing in East Germany and the West. Thus, the creation of protective and safe communal space places for members of the gay community, providing and disseminating information and representing members of community within the larger society were the principal factors motivating leadership of the gay uh, community. As one of the um, founding members and former secretary of Homeros London, the first Hungarian gay association, or homosexual, they called it the <coughs> homosexual association, um, he points out that it's, there was no real big panic about it. They were not aware of the, you know, the real dangers. And they really, what they really wanted to do, as you can read it here, um, um, uh, for us, the most important matter was to make the organization a gay liberation movement, equality, information exchange, and to create a space for the gay community. These were the main goals. The homosexual community was able to maneuver within the opportunities that opened up during the late 1980s and over time became emboldened to ask for things formerly unimaginable in state socialist Hungary. The fact that the president of the um, 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 of the Homeo Slamda could send an official letter to the chairman of the presidential council of the Hungarian People's Republic about ongoing police uh, harassment for the, of the gay community is only uh, the most conspicuous indication of the self-empowerment of the gay community. So you can read this uh, um, uh, part of this letter. So it's, uh, um, it's, it's point, it points out that you know we are many and you know we should uh, we deserve uh, your attention and stop harassment. So this is something which you know it was really unimaginable just a few years before. Conceptually, most members of the homosexual um, community and <coughs> leadership of its organization envisioned the Hungarian homosexual movement that existed within the confines of state socialism. Their aims of achieving greater social and official acceptance for the community were seen as concomitant this and firmly embedded within the ongoing liberalization of the state socialist political system, having greater freedom for the community, working towards social acceptance and demanding protection instead of harassment from the police, were to be achieved through working with the reform-minded authorities of the Hungarian state. 
not only their homosexuals, like their heterosexual counterparts, unlikely to challenge the existing political system, but they were also not even necessarily, necessarily aware of, let alone ready to articulate any dissent to the structural discriminations that existed against same-sex relationships. The following short uh, ex uh, excerpt from an interview with the former secretary of Homero Slum that illuminates the self-perception um, of homosexuals within state socialist uh, society. Um, you can see in this, uh, I mean, I, I, I would uh, <coughs> emphasize this part that while the, the entire country was oppressed, uh, it was a fact. The fact that we, gays, had even fewer rights than the rest of society was just not evident. This striking post-1989 assessment underscores, because we just conducted this interview a few years ago, underscores on, on the one hand how the homosexual community could coexist with the rest of mainstream society without feeling explicitly marginalized. Um, one does could also see how by introducing a new vocabulary and Western liberal ideas, the demographic, the demographic changes post-1989 actually could incite and fuel the feeling of marginalization of the LGBT community. On the other hand, it, is, it also sheds light on how having grown up in a society that was deeply homophobic and strictly heteronormative, the homosexual community could accept institutional and structural discrimination against same-sex couples and relationships as natural and self-edited evidence. Aside from police surveillance and homophobia, homosexuals also had to reckon with institutional and, stu and structural barriers that they faced in addition. Yet, these barriers not that homosexuals could, uh, uh, could not have a legally connect. Yet, these barriers that homosexuals couldn't have a legally recognized relationship, have a family, or even legally cohabit uh, the same apartment were accepted as part of life. In conclusion, the Hungarian homosexual community didn't fight or undermine the state socialist system, nor did they necessarily even envision a socialist society where homosexuals would have had the same civil and social rights as their heterosexual counterparts. Most Hungarian homosexuals and their organization looked to function within existing structures of late state socialism. Rather than socialism being in crisis, it was the crisis of public health and the perceived danger of AIDS that instigated the creation of the Homeros Lambda National Association of Homosexuals, the first formal gay and lesbian organization in Hungary. The establishment of Homeros Lambda in 1988 and the, in, and the initial politicization of the homosexual subculture um, um, took place not necessarily in opposition to state socialism, while the relaxing official attitudes of late socialism were essential for these developments. Working within the system didn't mean, however, that the homosexual community was at the mercy uh, of authorities. The, uh, this presentation revealed the considerable agency of Hungarian homosexuals in navigating space within late uh, socialist Hungary monopolizing the fear of the authorities of an impending public health crisis, the leaders of the homosexual community could increasingly request previously unimagined, unimagined, unimaginable things and even more unprecedentedly could actually be granted them. So, thank you very much.
from one hand side and from LGBT people from the other hand side. Uh, what can you say about that in uh, certain periods? Maybe you don't have data for each year or each uh, decade, but uh, some general uh, uh, overview maybe you can offer to us. Or uh, uh, maybe uh, the comparison with that age uh, with the current time. Time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think <coughs> methodologically this would be a, a challenge to um, um, to compare the present media representations of uh, of LGBTQ people or homosexuality or you know I mean, of these issues and uh, and uh, the earlier 20th century um, uh, representations. Though I have to say that we have empirical material. Um, based on um, the most widespread wide Hungarian daily between 1910 and 1939, <coughs> and, um, and that is very, I think, quite surprising that it's not uh, not at all uh, a bad representation, I would say. So it's not, uh, you know, we have expected much uh, more hostility or much uh, um, more explicit hostility, and it wasn't the case. And also, we well, we have uh, examined these uh, articles. Uh, um, well, these were printed press, of course. Uh, articles um, in the context of uh, gender variations. How you know the uh, non-conventional gender uh, representations were received or presented. So um, we can. Uh, um, well, say something about that, but it would be very, very difficult to compare those uh, um, uh, findings with, uh, let's say, present day um, findings. And, it, and I don't have present day findings, I'm not doing the media analysis of, uh, of present day media products, but um, we will continue. I mean, we, we have some. Uh, uh, some media uh, representation uh, analysis results uh, uh, from um, um, after uh, the, uh, the Second World War, but that is still quite uh, incomplete. What we what we know that um, uh, during state socialism, uh, uh, the it, it was the. Um, uh, presentation of these issues was characterized by very limited social visibility and for example we could see uh, that in the, the first uh, in the late 1980s when this first ha uh, Hungarian homosexual organization was established then it, it gained quite an uh, increased social visibility but mainly because of HIV AIDS so it was a, really this public health panic that you know what will happen and you know like only in this context and otherwise it was mainly the gossipy you know which was uh, showing, I don't know, men in female clothes. I mean, these are not media representations. Uh, these are um, from uh, the, this uh, Melek Fefiak uh, uh, blog. This is this gay man blog. It's a historical uh, blog which uh, collects uh, original material from activists. And, you know, from this, these are private uh, photos. So these are not from the Hungarian press. And uh, he is the he is actually the the, uh, the first president of the Hungarian homosexual organization Rosa Weber, which I quoted him. And he is the um, he is Las Lolane, who is the secretary I, of the Homero Sonda. This is from a party. These are from power parties, um, you know, uh, private parties when they were just entertaining themselves. So this is you know these are not uh, these are from home parties. And this is the Egyptian aspect. So the Egyptian, I don't know uh, that well, the older generation might, but you are not old, of course. So the older generation <laughs> might uh, remember that this was uh, the, one of the first uh, kind of gay-friendly places in Budapest. It was a proper espresso, like a, uh, it was a proper bar during the day. But at night, it it switched. It was you know it became uh, closed, and it was like you know this face control. At the, at the entrance, and if you were, well, I don't know, if you seem to be gay friendly, then you would, then you would be allowed in. And uh, it was one of these uh, uh, legendary places, which is unfortunately now turned into a, a bank office. So, uh, the, and you can see, you know, this very 1970s, you know, cool, uh, you know, inside. So, I don't know, I mean, this is so okay. But we are not underestimating the media. I saw you taking a seat, and that's why I also looked uh, for a chair. So no, 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 don't worry. No, 
I'm just. Um, yeah, we can just. Uh, keep yeah, this I, I, I didn't see. Uh, okay, yeah. I just want to. Frank. Okay, I have two questions. One is very short. Sorry. Why, uh, if I can, I will have uh, two questions. One referring to the criminalization, not the criminalization process. Uh, when reading the argument, uh, state officials gave for the criminalization process, <coughs> completely the same, I think, what was given in Czechoslovakia, in East Germany, not in Yugoslavia, it was very different. Uh, yeah, I know. Their, their point was very different at that moment. But uh, for the criminalization process, I don't know, in the year the first uh, socialist penal code was, uh, I, 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 didn't, I only heard it was. Um, no, we didn't. Uh, no, no, no. It's like this penal code, which introduced the criminalization yeah. of uh, homosexuality, yeah. was from the 19th century. Oh, so 1878. Uh, okay, Between 1878 and uh, yes. 1961. But then, where in that period? reforms of the bell curve. And I can suppose there, that... There the were reforms, but actually this uh, paragraph became... Okay. I mean, it was... Uh, it, it remained intact. Yeah. 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 Usually after the uh, introduction of state socialism,